Hello everybody, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel, your D&D data download for your increasingly impressive imagination. Today, as promised, we delve into the granola goodness of the Druid character class. And hopefully, by the end of this mini-series, you'll have a much better understanding of the class, who they are, what they do, where they come from, and just how diverse and integral this class is to the D&D world. Actually, no, let's do this, let's, let's not do this as a mini-series. Going by the few count, there are lots of folks who would rather I just dump all the info into one video. And I think um, I'll put some index links in the doobly-doo, maybe, so you can snap to specific topics. Let's see how that works out. Also, we shall have some options on what you want me to make a video on next at the end of this video. So, Druids in D&D stem directly from the Druids of old European pre-Christian faiths. They still have a lot of the symbology and incorporate a lot of the aspects of the faith into the class. This is why we have references to certain plants and trees. We have sidebar text mentioning some of the more important flora. But what is important about them exactly? Well, let's find out. Alder has important medicinal uses, the bark particularly. It's a hardwood, makes excellent musical instruments. The trees are very good for forest soil and disperse their seed widely, paving the way for forest growth with large, slow-growing uh, giant trees, eventually replacing all of the older. Ash, relative to olive and lilac, is a flowering tree. Norse mythology was misinterpreted as having uh, Yggdrasil, Yggdrasil being a cosmically huge ash tree, when it actually it is supposed to be a yew tree, also a sacred tree of the Druids. Ash trees uh, light and burn easily. They produce edible leaves for cows and goats and rabbits stored in autumn for winter feed. The tree is also a source of blue dye. The wood is excellent for clubs, bows, staves, and spears. Birch is a very resilient hardwood, difficult to work with hand tools. The tree has uh, it's a source of oils and tar, which can be used to make glue, uh, commonly used in fletching, arrow making. The oils in the wood mean that even when wet, the bark can burn, which is very handy to know if you're building a fire in miserable weather. It has medicinal uses, and yeah, a common thread with these sacred plants and trees is that they are very useful. You can make water-resistant leather using birch. The sap can be made into sweet syrup. The bark can be easily stripped and made into waterproof light bowls, uh, tents, and canoes. Elderberries, uh, elder produce berries. The flowers are also edible. The stems are hollow and make good pipes, drainage, and that sort of thing. There is a common folklore about a strong feminine association with the elder, and many country people would ask permission from a female uh, deity before um, cutting down an elder. A typical tradition would be to offer your body when you die in exchange for some of the plant's body now. I could go on some detail about the plants mentioned. For my Patreon subscribers, I have a link to the site which has information on all of them and more, so that's really good reading. In the game, Druids first became a playable character class in the 1976 supplement, our Eldritch Wizardry. By the way, this is one very important supplement. It introduced psionics and psychic monsters like the Mind Flayers. It introduced the demons, including Orcus and Demogorgon, and artifacts like the Rod of Seven Parts and the Axe of the Dwarven Lords. They appear as a subclass, like a playable option of the Cleric character class in the first edition of Player's Handbook. They retain some of the um, important defining limitations that in, of that version in the modern 5th edition, such as weapon proficiencies and the aversion to any metal armour. And I hope to some, shed some light on why the no metal armour thing is so important. Uh, it should be pretty clear and logical, but more on that later. Um, well, actually now, when you're wild shaping into a different form, you, you don't want to wear armour. Uh, metal armour doesn't gel well with uh, changing form, so... Um, yeah, it kind of blocks natural energies. Um, energy flow is very important. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> druids should, could cast more spells per day than the wizard and cast them faster than a cleric. They've always made a wide array of spells available which covered both healing, support, and offensive tasks. So really a jack-of-all-trades uh, spell cl casting class. With that came some story-based role-playing restrictions, such as a strict requirement for a neutral alignment and having to attain higher levels by challenging and defeating higher-ranking druids in their circles or other circles. Plus, they took on the responsibility of being a circle leader with lower-level druids looking at them 
uh, looking to them for teaching and challenging them in due course. You know, the, uh, at higher levels, the arch steward would come to gain true primal power and understanding, such that they would uh, be able to summon elementals and traverse the, uh, or even dwell in the outer planes. There is mention of a race of druids in my video on planet races who dwell within the elemental chaos. If you want to check that out. As the second edition of the game developed, the druid class was still very much a cleric class. They no longer had any differentiation on their spell, spell casting abil uh, capabilities aside from different spell selections. The Complete Druids Handbook of 1994 did provide a lot of detail on druidic tools, herbalism, the Society of Druids and their Sacred Groves. And finally, in 3rd edition, Druids are their own character class. And they have a few less hard restrictions on equipment, though they basically cease to have any Druid powers when wearing metal armour, until they take it off again. Druids are also available in Shades of Neutral, so they... Shades of Neutral. So they can be chaotic, lawful, good or evil leanings of neutral. They gain the ranger-like power to summon an animal companion and could throw away a prepared spell to summon an animal ally instead. The jump from 3rd edition to 3.5 saw druids go from a fixed chosen animal shape they could assume to an array of animal um, forms and at high levels even elemental forms, which is something they've kept in 5th edition, in a way. 4th edition got around to druids in the second player's handbook and druids were slotted into the controller party role with a focus of course on the primal keyword for the power source other than the changes that every class in that edition um, had not a huge amount of changes for what a druid is really just refining the role a bit more and their function within a party of adventurers where they tend to be either a leader or more of a striker fifth edition finally we have a druid as a core class in the player's handbook and whereas the druids start out as a subclass, now they're a core class with their own subclasses. These are called circles, and we have two official circles, with three more as official playtest circles, and I'll talk about each of them during this video. So, what makes a druid? First, a little bit about uh, living close to nature. Perhaps I have a good ex uh, perspective on it, thanks to the country I live in. It's a relatively young nation, New Zealand. People are still settling, settling wilderness areas at this very moment. A lot of the country is pristine nature. You can spend a whole day on some of the beaches and never see another person. When my ancestors got here, they had only the tools and supplies they could carry into the forest, and it was back-breaking work building a settlement where nobody, nobody had settled before, not even the local iwi. Not only that, but the trees and plants and animals were not the same as the ones in the country they had left behind many months ago via sea, and they had to learn the new rules of the new land. Wisdom is the ability score of perception, awareness and insight. It is the primary ability of the druid and the connection, the awareness and understanding they have of the natural environment. Druids know nature. They have a relationship with it. It is more than just a resource. It is integral to their survival. The forest, the jungle, tundra, desert, seashore, lakeside, wherever they are, provides them with medicine information, tools, resources, food, shelter, stability, and prosperity. It is their chosen role to be custodians and protector of that relationship, not just for themselves, but for everyone and all things that are a part of it. Because it is made up of all of these parts, it's a system, it's an ecosystem. All druids are very focused on their relationship with nature, but how that manifests itself can be different from one druid to the next. There is a lot of variation, much like wizards develop a portfolio of skills and spells as they begin to become more specialised down one school or another of magic, the druid starts with an unusual knack for nature craft. They will gravitate towards learning how to harvest and prepare medicine, make tools and prepare shelter, harvest and prepare food, store food, learn about hunting, gathering, identification of tracks, leaves, flowers, trees, territory and habits of animals. They will learn to recognise the, the supernatural elements of D&D forests, such as fey creatures, areas where they've got a close proximity to other realms, areas that have negative energy. They will learn from elders in their community, and they will tag along with hunters, harvesters, shamans, and at some point, either early on or when they become noticeably gifted, they will become known to, and some introduction will be made to the druids. Druids will be on the lookout for very observant people, or questioning people. 
One may get the impression that the druidic circles are individual organizations, groups that are, part, uh, are apart from each other, like separate guilds of thieves. They are not really like that. The druids tend to be a loose organization for the most part anyway. Gatherings of druids are not always made up of members of the same circle. They would be, uh, it would be normal for a gathering to be many of the druids within a local area and include members of different circles, much like wizards of different schools and not from actual different physical schools, like separate buildings, if you see what I mean. However, the local group will tend to gather in this, the local sacred grove, and those who do so regularly will be the druid circle of that grove. They will be made... Um, up of people who make decisions on policy and actions together based on their own internal hierarchy. If you want a really great analogy of what druid circles are like, you, you need to look no further than role-playing groups. A lot of the social interactions and associations are very similar to the way RPG groups form and break up, have internal politics, house rules, reputations, and so on. So my suggestion is to apply your own life experience with that to your druid circles in the D&D world. Great druid circles work well together. They get along, they cooperate, they get things done, have a good reputation. They can have a whole social group built around them, uh, be very pivotal to the affairs of a wilderness community or even something like an ethnic community of elves who live in a sprawling human city. Because druids don't just um, concern themselves only with nature. A, a city is an, e an ecosystem itself. It's an ecology. Ostensibly, like a D&D group, in the circle, all are equal. They do, however, respect age and experience, and there are those who are recognized by the group to be chief decision makers. They can be informal, or it can be fairly tyrannical. Bad druid circles may have argument, they, well, they may be argumentative. They associate more out of an obligation than real enjoyment. There is infighting, competitiveness, they can cause conflicts that divide whole social groups and lead to individuals being spurned or forced out. Druids spend a lot of time teaching others how to use the resources of the wild responsibly and sustainably. They are living custodians of law, but they are also conduits and very gifted manipulators of the forces of nature who can do some spectacular and very powerful things. The circles in the main book are the circles of the land and the circle of the moon. In Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, we have the circles specific to certain areas, but they're made up of moon and land druids. Uh, still very interesting, though. I'll talk about them in a minute. In Unearthed Arcana, we have the circle of dreams, very much a fey circle. We have the circle of the shepherd, not entirely about sheep, very disappointing, but still very much about animals, beasts, fauna, and I have to say, the circle that really brings the pain. Totally gets a thumbs up from me. And finally, we have the circle of twilight, not about the sparkly vampires, but actually sort of still about vampires, all undead actually, and it raises an interesting point to talk about. Um, but let's have a look at each of the circles and what they do. Uh, circle of the Land. I think of the Circle of the Land as the baseline druid. They are the law keepers, the instructors who will not only take promising people under their wing, but also lend their wisdom to communities who live in harmony with the environment. They are very important for their knowledge of what to grow, where to grow it and when to grow it. They predict the weather, protect from natural disasters and provide very real, practical, day-to-day -day support that is an enormous benefit to their people. Even more so than a cleric of any particular god, who for sure can heal people, cure disease and provide blessings and purifications of water and such, the druid can provide sustainable food, teach people how to make homes, clothing, animal husbandry, keep the animals healthy and productive, provide sound advice on where to dig wells, lay a path for a road, or even what bit of land is best to build on, what trees have the best timber for any particular structure. And a druid of the land is not just a caretaker of their chosen environment, they are a sacred person to those that they serve. They are respected for their words carry great weight with the common folk. In a harsh environment like a desert, the word of a druid can mean life or death. They, they learn spells that provide f uh, food and water, protect from raiders, and allow safe passage across wide open spaces. Coastal druids can summon elementals, use the water itself as a tool or a force of destruction. They can act as diplomats between the races beneath the waves and the coastal dwellers. Those druids of the forest are very in tune with the world and can carry news swiftly between settlements, as well as protect their people and the forest itself with blasts of lightning. Reflecting their focus on learning and the ancient traditions of the land circle, these druids get an uh, additional cantrip at second level. And if you look at the cantrips, you can see that le druids learn spells that transfer and manipulate energy. 
uh, from the very start they can instantly uh, intensify it to create heat and flame they can divert it to provide protection or cold they can infuse it to allow plants to flower fruit or grow incredibly quickly and they are very sensitive to how it moves and transfers in the environment around them so they can sense the weather the wind flow the water in the ground the movements of the animals and the relationship between all of those things druidic language is part of this ancient knowledge they can leave messages in the form of scratched notches on trees and stems they also have meanings for each type of wood the names of trees are also letters in the alphabet of druidic which is really the ancient irish alphabet called ogham in the DD world it is a bit more complicated and far removed from the ogham of ancient ireland after all druidic has been a vital and living language of druid society for a much longer time it also incorporates the rituals of druidic magic and it's reasonable to say that a 17th level druid could leave a message that a six level druid would not understand because they don't have the deep mysteries and truths that, um, that a lower level druid it's not yet experienced enough to know much like wizards they can constantly learn as they grow and experience and they seek out more experienced druids to set them on paths to reach new heights of insight so druids in a party can even at first level easily gather whatever is needed for a comfortable campsite in the very short time particularly if it is a land druid in their chosen environment but any druid will become acclimatized in a new current environment as long as it's not too completely alien to them they can even adapt to the shadow fell and the elemental chaos given sufficient time and experience of course whatever environment a druid is in with some time spent observing the native animals they can study attune with and assume the form of a native creature which makes adaptation a whole lot easier also using wild shape allows a druid to move very easily and quickly also mostly safely across the world they are beyond the concerns of national borders they have locations and networks that are established long before any of the current nations were in the forgotten realms the great upheavals that have changed the very geography of the land and sea is of great import to the druids so it has been a time of great activity and urgent action saving endangered animals relocating communities and mapping the new state of the world of toral all druids that reach level 17 are so in tune or oh, beyond level 17 18th level are so in tune with the energy of the natural world that they, they slow the aging process to a crawl aging only one year for every decade that passes this means that a human having spent their early life adventuring and survived to say level 18 at the tender age of 30 could live another 500 years an elf could live over six and a half thousand years this means that there may well be elves alive on toral that lived through the sixth crown war the beginning of the age of humanity the liberation of the Durga from the mind flavors the founding and the fall of the dwarven realm of delzaun the entire history of the netheral empire including the year of sundered webs where Cassus cast the spell Cassus' avatar the only level 12 spell ever cast by a mortal which allowed him to temporarily steal the power of the goddess mistral and cause incredible destruction they could have been there for that anyway you get my point the druids hold vast amounts of living memory of the past not just the histories written by winners of wars and fanciful accounts passed on by bards so ancient dru druids know the location and history of a great many of the world's lost and presumably forgotten tombs dungeons burned uh, buried citadels mines and so on this makes them of natural interest to researchers of ancient lore and adventurers on the hunt for ancient treasures or remedies for risen natural uh, terrors of the past they have returned to plague the present and of course druids seek out heroes in such times of crisis to gift them with tools to fight such evils as well as keep watch on sites of ancient evil fighting evils is a specialty of the circle of the moon and the circle of twilight the circle of the moon is reserved for druids with a talent for wild shaping they can assume an, an animal and at a high level even an elemental form and spend a lot of their time prowling around beyond civilization these are the hunters of badness the protectors of the natural world the patrollers of sleeping evils and the first warning system of the druids when a druid of the moon circle cont contracts uh, contacts another druid of any circle and issues a warning or a call to action this message is never dismissed or taken lightly for dungeon masters this may be a very good limited use story element for your druid character to hook them into a side quest or begin the adventure 
Druids of the moon gather at night for three nights of the full moon. Um, they are the time that uh, that's the time they convene in ancient groves and circles of standing stones to discuss current events occurring over a, a wide, uh, very wide area. By the way, side note: uh, the groves of a wizard circle are not just standing stones; they may actually be specifically planted trees. Um, those sacred trees I was talking about are very useful, have many uses, so they may plant a variety of these trees to form the sacred grove, which becomes um, a resource for the communities in that area. Um, if you want to think of the circle of a land of the land um, as a local law enforcement, the circle of the moon are more like federal agents, though this is a very loose analogy. When facing a moon circle druid in combat, well, they're terrifying. They have physical strikes which have the potency of magical weapons. They can not only transform into an animal, at level 14 they can sprout gills, spines, fangs and snake eyes to simply freak people out. They can easily evade detection by simply changing their face, hair, colour and stature. They spend so much time in an altered physical state, they may feel detached from whatever race they were, whatever nation they were raised in. They become aloof and a law unto themselves, which can be unsettling to those who would call them friend. In places of disease, despair and darkness, you'll find the druids of twilight on the hunt for the lingering dead. They seek to maintain the natural cycle of life and death, so undead are anathema to them. Typically, these are druids who have suffered some trauma at the hands of such abominations and dedicate their lives to protecting the living and annihilating the undead. Somewhat ironically, Twilight Druids have a spooky ability to drain life force when they cast damaging spells. Um, so they unleash necrotic energy from a dice pool they, uh, they add to spell damage. As the foes fall before their onslaught, allies around them are imbued with life energy, healing them as the Twilight Druids go into wraith mode. They also have the power to speak with the dead, resist radiant and necrotic damage, and become ethereal once per rest and allow allies advantage when saving against death. They excel against undead creatures, but their powers work very effectively against the living, uh, and they are not a comfortable thing to witness in action. For the Twilight Druid, the ends justify the means. Um, and as a side note, this uh, this concentration of the druids fighting things which are unnatural, I would like to see Wizards of the Coast produce a druid circle that is specifically dedicated to fighting abominations. Um, because I can quite easily imagine, say, a mind flower, a mind flayer getting uh, attacked by a bunch of Githyanki or Githserai druids that um, fight abominations specifically and have specific abomination fighting powers. That would be very cool. If anybody's got a homebrew of that, let me know. The Circle of the Shepherd best embodies the neutrality of druids and those that care more for the fate of animals than civilizations. They are not, however, the Peter of D&D. For those of you who have ever made a green beast summoning deck playing Magic the Gathering, you will know why I think these druids kick ass. If you slam the castle door in a shepherd druid's face, the next thing that comes through that door is a charging diabear that just finds arrows slightly annoying. These druids spend a lot of time with animals. In animal form, talking with animals is a hallmark of the shepherds. They can speak with any mere animal, and it is a talent that they um, they sort out for in their new recruits, those who can talk with animals very well. Um, with attunement to animal communities, they have the benefit of animal spirits. These are not individual bears and wolves and hawks that have passed on and linger as watching guardians. These are the collective spirit of the living population of bears, all bears, all wolves, all hawks. They identify with and infuse the shepherd druid as though the druid is a bear, wolf or hawk. And by invoking these spirits, shepherd druids create an area effect like a summoned totem and allies within 30 feet of the spirit gain certain benefits depending on what spirit is called forth. And the shepherds can do this for a minute once per rest. Also, groups of shepherds can call forth multiple spirits over the same area. Now, combine this with their ability to summon the strongest animals and then stack bolstering spirits on top of them. And yeah, shepherd druids can be devastating directors of mayhem. They also have the benefit at high level when they fall um, in battle that they will be protected by animals who will stand guard over them when they're down. Last, we have the Circle of Dreams, the friends of the little people, the fae and fairy folk. I have a character, a forest gnome, who is a druid of the circle. 
first from a game mechanics perspective they are your best healer druids they are also the um, they have the balm of the summer court which is represented by a pool of six-sided dice that can be used to heal others and also increase their movement speed at the same time by five feet per die this means a 10th level dream druid can increase the speed of an ally by 50 feet for a full minute can you imagine an elven barbarian in the party charging around crackling with glitter covering 95 feet per round yeah that's happening the Dream Druid regains these dice when they have a long rest. Uh, they also attain the Fey power to conceal campsites from distant observers, while at the same time increasing the camper's vigilance. They also gain the mastery of hidden paths, allowing them to basically misty step, mi- mi- misty step like an Aladrin, teleporting up to 30 feet as their movement action. And then finally, beyond level 13th, uh, they can attain the Purifying Light. This allows them to cast healing spells on others, which also act as dispel magic spells casting the healing spells level um, of dispel magic so whatever level of healing spell it is is also the level of dispel magic that's cast on that, that target in one fell swoop they can also uh, use this combo on three targets per long rest they can reverse whammy three allies in one swoop with this power which is pretty cool time to finish up just a quick mention of the druid circles groves groups networks of note at large in the forgotten realms the circle of swords operates in and around the nether winter wood uh, they do not act react favorably to goblinoids and orcs anyone going in there to loot ruins or anyone interested in harvesting the living trees of timber uh, for timber the emerald enclave has been the name of an association of druid groups of many circles that operate in and around the Vilhon reach in the far north to protect the civilized people along the savage frontier uh, founded over a thousand years ago it involves rangers druids barbarians homesteaders and bards they are actually a widespread organization that has gotten involved in a lot of world events over that time so their influence is felt widely across the whole continent of Faerun you can recognize a member of the emerald uh, by the emerald green cloth that they include as part of their clothing the harpers have a working relationship with the druids of course sometimes it's very amicable sometimes really not the harpers get along okay when they don't ignore the druids sound advice or stern warnings but there have been incidents where harpers cause the druids no end of problems and druid circles don't easily forget Finally, the Moonshay Isles have a sect of druids who are very focused on the land as a living goddess. They venerate her at these moonwell pools that have mystical healing properties for those who care for the land, but may poison those who despoil the land. Druids in the Forgotten Realms, I should mention, more so than clerics, venerate a pantheon of gods. They respect the good and the bad in nature, so they also venerate gods that are commonly seen as evil, evil gods but this is um this old faith is pretty much like the old religion of the game of thrones people may give gifts to the uh, of the harvest to shrines dedicated to chauntia the goddess of agriculture farmers gardeners and summer eldath a non-violent goddess of rivers and waterfalls meiliki goddess of forests autumn forest creatures many rangers and fey sylvanus god of nature patron of the druids malar god of the hunt savage beasts tooth and claw commonly revered, uh, regarded as an evil god oral cruel goddess of cold winter umberly goddess of oceans currents waves sea winds drowning talos ga- uh, god of storms destruction rebellion conflagrations earthquakes and vortices so the druids give thanks and acknowledge all of these eight gods you can find their names and alternate names or symbols left on many sacred stones or places where their god's presence is strongly felt by the druids and they leave these markers of significance there so they can stop and give their respect okay i hope that provided some fresh perspective perspective on the druids uh, informed your use and role play of them inspired you to include them in your campaign world sparked these <laughs> those creative chooses this video took me about two days to research and put together and i learned a lot about this class i didn't know before so thank you for your request for me to cover the player character class back to some more dragons in the interlude but i'd like to hear from you what player class uh you would like me to cover next would it be ranger bard monk rogue fighter barbarian cleric warlock sorcerer paladin let me know also next playable race to cover is the dragonborn thanks to many requests but I've been inspired to talk about the Furbolg, of course, thanks to all this focus on druids, so expect a bit on them soon. 
Thanks as always for listening, everyone. I'll catch you again soon. Additional links and info are available uh, once again to the Patreon subscribers. If you like this video, please express yourself with a thumbs up and please share this video with your friends and your circle of gaming. Catch you later, everyone.